All right, we are getting ready to make a start. We have given a half an hour of grace period and we are going to kick off. So tech guys, you guys are good to go? Yes? A pleasant good afternoon to everyone who is here. Um, I would like to extend greetings on behalf of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers and the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited who have been gracious enough to afford us this um, facility to utilize this afternoon for this interaction with you students. So we really want to give our colleagues at BPW a big thank you. And there's also some goodies um, awaiting for you after the interaction, which they have graciously um, given to us to share with you. So what's going to happen this afternoon, it is very much meant to be an interaction. It's not going to be just people talking to you but we're also expecting you as students and parents to interact with the persons who are here. So you have some professional engineers who are here at the front. One or two are going to turn up as well, and we have one of our professionals at the back. We also have a manager from the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union who's here, and he's going to be speaking to you about finance matters. And when I say finance matters, I mean getting a loan to go away to study. For those of you who will be pursuing studies outside of Barbados or even inside of Barbados, you may need some additional financing and understanding how you go about getting that financing. So Glenn um, Belgrave is here from the credit union. He will, he's going to be sharing with you guys um, some options that are available. And again, this is an interaction. So we are asking that you ask questions. Don't be shy. We don't want you to go away from here today not having information. The whole point of today is to get as much information as you can so that when you go away, you're better informed with the choices that you're hoping to make in the near future as it pertains to what you are aspiring to, to study. Engineering has many facets and many different disciplines that you can apply yourself to. So please do ask questions and make this afternoon as interactive as you can. So this afternoon, we are going to have the following speakers. Sorry, my name is Vincent Jones. I am the first vice president of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers. I also, ironically, am employed by the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited as their project manager construction. So I'm wearing two hats this afternoon. And some of you may be saying, but what is an engineer doing working at a credit union? Um, you'll be surprised, engineers find themselves working at a lot of interesting places, including the CDB and various banks around the island and around the world, as well as different corporate entities, because engineering knowledge is not just confined to engineering works, right? Um, basically, engineers are people that think and know how to think on their feet and how to problem solve. And there are other um, institutions that benefit from that problem-solving ability. So you can find that you will start off in one facet of life, and you may end up in a completely different one down the road. So don't pigeonhole yourself and just think that an engineering is about putting on boots and going out onto the job site. So we're going to dispel, dispel some of those myths today. And we really want to make it, as I said, and I will keep repeating, an interactive session. So first up, we're going to have Ms. Um, engineer Kenton Gamble. He's going to be discussing what is engineering. We're then going to have engineer Alexander Guppy, and he's going to focus a bit on electrical engineering. We're going to have um, engineer Akeem Nurse, and he's going to be speaking about engineering from a different perspective. And then we're going to have my colleague, Glenn Belgrave, who will be dealing with the finance matters from the credit union side. And after everyone has spoken, you are invited to go up to any of the professionals that you will see and ask questions, whether it's pertaining to why they made the choice to become an engineer, uh, what was their experience like at university, um, what was their process in terms of where they started and where they are now, what type of subjects they might have done at secondary school. Anything you can ask, what is wants is not about anybody's personal business, that is good. You're free to ask us even things like, how much money do you work for? Because that's a very important question. Don't be shy. It's about engaging with people this afternoon. Everybody understand what I'm saying? 
My grandmother used to tell me, we ain't, here, we ain't a bite in a body, so don't be shy. Ask questions. Um, the way it's going to operate once uh, we have the presentation, we'll take some questions off of each presentation. And then, as I said, once everything is wrapped up, you are free. Come in, sit down. Come in and sit down, guys. You are free then to interact with the professionals who are in the room. So welcome, welcome. You haven't missed anything. Um, we are about to start. So Engineer Gamble, can you make yourself close? And OK. Alex, you're going to do slides for him? Good man, thank you. All right, pleasant good afternoon to one and all. Uh, thankful that you guys could be here. Um, my presentation has around 15 slides. Uh, you could keep track underneath. Uh, so <laughs> if you get it a little too long, you could just count down the numbers, right? All right, so. Ready to go. Right, so my name is Kenton Gamble, and I'm a civil and structural engineer. Um, I'm a member of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers, BAPE, and I'm also a graduate member of the ICE, which is the Institute of Civil Engineers. All right, that's in the UK. All right, so today we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, how I got here and what I do, right? So how did I get here? Yeah, so no, I did not study uh, rocket science. Uh, no, it's not that complicated. I just, this, um, I'm just gonna go into the process of how I get in here. So next slide. A little bit about the process. In school, I did CXCs. Uh, quite a number of them. Math I have on top there, uh, physics, chemistry, technical drawing, geography, English lit, lang, and Spanish. You don't have to do those exact ones. The major ones is math, physics, chemistry. Those ones you need for sure. Technical drawing is an asset. Uh, you really want it to get that done. Um, sixth form, I did. I, choose, I chose to do sixth form. Not, you don't have to do sixth form. There are many options. There's the, you can go to the Barbers Community College. They also have a civil engineering program um, at, at the associate level. I then went on from sixth form to the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago, where I studied civil engineering. All right, and presently, so currently I work with ACI, Adams Consulting International, and I am one of their project engineers, right? So in order to get there though, I kind of missed a step, just to add in a little bit. In 2021, I became a registered engineer. So just in 2021. Right, so what do you do? What do we actually do? So. Civil and structural engineering. So structural is actually a branch of civil engineering. Um, it's one of the subsets. Um, there's a lot of different areas in civil that you can go into. There are, you can do roads, you can do many things when you study civil engineering degree. And, ooh, sorry. <laughs> I, just, I just saw uh, one of my, well, I would say, a mentor, uh, Greg, engineer Greg Paris in the back. Right, so how a typical project works. So I just wanted to show this particular slide. Um, this is not how all projects go, but we often start with a client. He wants to get something built. Uh, maybe it's a building, it's a warehouse, uh, you name it. Something needs to be built. He wants, he has the financing to do it. Uh, then we come down, sometimes we have the architect in that position, um, sometimes we have a project manager in that higher position, which coordinates the project. Sometimes the architect does the project management, and they liaise with the client to get the idea of what they want to be built. They produce drawings describing what the intent of what needs to be built. Where we come in as a structural engineer is once they have finalized what they want to be built, the, the aesthetics, how they want it to look, 
we come in and we try to make it work. We want to calculate the loads and make sure that everything functions and stays up. All right. So we got some other key players in there. Uh, we have the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers. So you're going to hear from one of those a little later on. He's an electrical engineer. Alex Copy, graduate engineer, sorry. Uh, we have the contractor. So he's the guy on site actually wielding the, the hammer and doing the hard labor. And then we culminate with the finished product, right? So moving on to our next slide. Hey, good evening. So what does it mean that I do on a daily basis? Uh, it's kind of pretty simple. Uh, we do design and analysis. So based on based on the drawings from the architect that they sent us, um, we have to design and calculate the loads on the building or structure, and then design the components um, to to meet the demands. So obviously there are demands on every structure, and they vary depending on the use of the structure. And then based on the drawings that we produce. And we have to go on site during the construction process and make sure that those designs are built. Right? There is also some project management and administration involved. We have to attend meetings and discuss with clients about the progress. All right. Next slide. So this is some of the software that we use. This is not all. Uh, so AutoCAD. AutoCAD is a very handy software. We use it quite a bit. Uh, there's also, they also make, Autodesk also makes a, some other software, Civil 3D and Robot Structural Analysis. And those as well can be used. They're civil related software. So if you want to design stuff with pipe networks, you would use Epinet or similar software. Um, Hetcross also modeling of watersheds and that kind of stuff. All right. There are plenty of other software out there. Uh, don't, don't feel that you have to learn all of these. Um, by the time you are finished your studies, maybe they're going to be new software. I'm actually trying to learn a new software myself. Um, well, it's not that new, but a software called Rivet, also by Autodesk. Um, they they allow you to model in three-dimensional space. So instead of doing 2D drawings, there's the introduction of three-dimensional, that three-dimensional anima as well. All right, so we're gonna go on to the next slide. All right, we. Yeah, come again. All right. The way to do great work is to love what you do uh, by Steve Jobs. And this is a little bit of what I do on a day. You could press click again. So this is CAD software, just some joints flicking through. Uh, this is a very, very small structure. <laughs> I chose the smallest thing that I could find just so my client doesn't. Um, right? And this is um, analysis software. So just particular software is called TEDS. And this is just a quick design of like a beam analysis, just looking at the spans. Three spans, just go through quickly. All right, so we also apply the loads. All right, so this is just to give you an idea of what I do on a daily basis. Um, Obviously, this is not to bore you. This is not. <laughs> this is not all there is to it. But this is a subset of what I do. Right. So other software I also use. We use a lot of Excel. Um, I think I have a little bit of it coming on to the end of this particular video. And uh, yeah, this is some of the. Going into detailing the actual size of the beam, selecting the type of concrete and reinforcement, 
And I try to just go in through it pretty fast. You kind of get some results, and based on those results, you're able to design how much steel goes in, right? So here is a little bit more in depth into the design process. So based on the loads, we have to design the amount of reinforcement that goes into the beam. So there's me here selecting different reinforcement bar diameters and number of bars. Just trying to get everything into the green. Kind of a lengthy process. So the last session there is talking about the shear Shear would be the stirrups the, around the side of the beam. All right, there we go. We have a beam design. That's not all, that's not all to it. Obviously, there's a, a little bit more to it, but that is the shortest version that I could, I could do for this particular presentation. Those are the idea of the results. All the results come in a spreadsheet version. We can also do these by hand, so what? What we encourage persons to do first coming out is to do these calculations by hand, get an understanding of all of the intricacies and variables involved, get an understanding of how they work. This is me using Excel. So similar to the other software, we also have Excel spreadsheets that do similar things. Um, yeah, that's kind of... RCC spreadsheets. All right, so coming on to the end of that. All right, next slide. Here we go. So slide number 10, we're almost there. Anybody remember how much slides I said I had? 15, all right, somebody listen to me. <laughs> Right, this is just a couple of the projects that I worked on. Um, yeah, so we got it. the estates. We have a project in St. Vincent, um, Ocean 2 and 4 Winds on the West Coast. So down bottom is a villa on the West Coast. This is a hotel on the South Coast. Next slide. So sometimes we get a chance to work with the Barbados Water Authority on their pumping stations in terms of designing their infrastructure, um, the, the buildings surrounding their, their plants and so forth. Next slide. All right. We also assist when they do steel tanks. Um, the steel tank, they have their own supplier, but we assist in the civil works surrounding the, the tank. At the bottom here, uh, I just wanted to show like an analysis. Uh, so sometimes you gotta use software. This particular one, um, we were analy analyzing a structure for just one more click. So this particular roof, it's a pretty large roof. So we decided to go ahead and do a little analysis on it. In, in a robot, and that's the fit, well, almost finished project. That's the, the rafter is in place, and then obviously on top of that, they would have placed thatch similar to this roof, all right? All right, 11, next slide. So engineers are the single most indispensable group needed for developing and maintaining any country's infrastructure and standard living. 
but they are rarely thought of as leaders of the society. Instead of being perceived as those who run things, engineers are seen as those who make things run. And this is by Richard Feingart, an American structural engineer. So let's keep that in mind. So you might not see us um, on the news that often, but we help to make things run. Uh, next slide. Just a couple fun facts before we depart. This is why um, it's important to, to study engineering. There are, particularly in Barbados, uh, well, around the world as well, um, we got 1,750 kilometers of road network, 80% are paved. And these stats are a little old, you see back in 2015. Obviously, there are more roads now, over 115,000 vehicles and growing every day. And around 5,000 heavy trucks, that number is also growing, and 600 public transport vehicles, that's an estimate. And we also have a, like, almost 130, over 130,000 buildings on the island and growing. So that's just some of the stats around the industry. And 14, slide number 14. Oh, thank you for listening to me. Do you have any questions? Don't worry, I, have, I still have slide number 15, but before we get to there, we're gonna have a couple of questions if you have. So when you are calculating the loads, what if there's um, an error that goes, that comes with that? What if there's an error? Okay. So sometimes errors occur. And if I can't resolve it, I go to one of my seniors. Um, when you say error, you mean, you mean within the software itself or you mean within so there's also, we can also do these calculations by hand. Mm -hmm. So to verify what any error that you may get in the software, we can do the calculation by hand also. Okay. Or we can use the Excel spreadsheet. So all of them kind of interrelate and we can double check back on each other. All right. And how long did it take to make this presentation? How long did it take to make this presentation? This particular presentation? Oh, well, you sure? <laughs> honesty, honesty, Kenton. So honestly, I gave this presentation back in 2020 to um, St. Michael's School. I changed it a little bit. I added some more photos. And I added, what did I add? Some more. Well, I had to change the fact that I became an engineer and some dates and some stuff which I did yesterday. So I took a little bit of a, yeah, probably about a word to a thing yesterday and I did it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, ooh, we got one more question. Oh yeah, you could leave that set up. Great afternoon. Um, my question is, what's the largest thing that you've ever made or what's the most work you've ever done on one project by yourself? By myself? Well, so that, that is a very good question. We kind of work in a lot of teams um, in the office. Um, so it's fairly rare if you work on a project by yourself. Um, currently, Currently, I would say my largest project would have been probably Oceans 2. And I wasn't the lead engineer on that particular project, but I did assist in inspections and a little bit of the analysis. Okay, um, follow-up question. In relation to the last one, you said that a percentage of the work can be done by hand. What percentage would you say of your calculations can be done by hand? Well, you probably don't want to analyze a large structure by hand. Right. <laughs> it might take quite a bit. Um, but what we usually do is we would 
do the model of it in a three, three D, three dimensional um, software, so robot analysis, and then verify those results. Um, just double check them by hand or by another software. All right, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Sure. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. Can you give us some insights in your training initially from, let's say, when you left sixth form through to university? The courses, some give some insight the courses that you would have done. Also, the direction that engineering will take in, as you see, in the next couple of years or decade in Barbados. So as a direct students or interested persons, as to the most lucrative, exciting, and challenging areas of engineering as you see with needed in development of the country. Thank you. All right, thank you for your question. I'm going to start with the first one. <laughs> um, my transition from sixth form into university, um, because I would have studied math at C, uh, Cape level, um, math courses were easy. Um, physics I also did. Uh, so that made the transition for me relatively smooth. Um, those coming from the Barbados Community College, having done the associate degree, however, they have a lot more background in the mechanics, the solids, and a better understanding of the structures. Uh, whereas that side of things, I would have had to learn in when I got to university. So. For me, I, f I spent quite spent quite a bit of time um, with colleagues that would have been at the same community college, trying to brush up on that side of the understanding structures, understanding moments and bending moments, shear that kind of stuff. So they do a lot of that specific stuff in the associate program. Whereas my my degrees would have been like sorry my my CAPE studies would have been more math specific, physics specific, chemistry specific. So yeah, that's one of the advantages of going into the Barbados Community College program. But you're not gonna you're not going to um, miss out if you go to six four. Um, it's just you have to when you get to university, you gotta put in that work to catch up and get the understanding of of how the industry works and that kind of stuff. Next question about exciting um, engineering. I think I think the industry is um, has a bright future. There are always things going up. Um, there's a lot of projects you see in all around the island. Um, there's a lot of room within the industry, particularly the, both on the so there are two different sides. So you have the consulting side of things where you mainly do a lot of design work within the office. And there's also the project management side, which a lot of the engineers tend to go into. Um, so you also need engineers on site to supervise the, the works. You need, as well as engineers in the office to design. Obviously, those engineers in the office also have to inspect as well. Um, so depending on which area you want to get into, um, there's plenty of avenue to go into. And I would say, um, do what you love to do. <laughs> I love what you do, yeah. Thank you. And that's slide number five. <laughs> Sorry. So this particular slide just gives you some information about the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers. So if you get a chance, you can probably take a picture of it. The second thing there is supposed to be the, the, the address, but you could get that from the secretary who's in the back. Her name is Stacy Burgess, and she probably has some more information on you as well. Thank you, Engineer Kenton Gamble. So, Kenton made a comment just now about he had to change the slide because um, he was now an engineer. So let me explain a little bit about that because some of you may be confused. 
Um, as with most professions or professional occupations, when you finish your degree and you enter the, your profession, you do not automatically qualify as a professional. So when you're finishing um, UE as a, a intern, uh, you have, uh, as a doctor, you're not a doctor until you've done that internship, that period of, or that, that actual working experience inside of the hospital. Likewise, with an engineering discipline, until uh, you have done some work experience both in the field and in the design office, you cannot qualify to be called an engineer. So there's a period of work experience that is required for you to go through, and then you have to register. There's a registration process. And then once you pass that registration process, then you can qualify to be called a professional engineer. So I just wanted to make that clear so that you understand um, what Kenton was speaking about. So he would have done his degree, he would have worked for a period of time with an office, and then after that, he would have gone through the registration process, thereby becoming a professional engineer, okay? Right, so the next, uh, just to acknowledge some persons we have in the room, um, engineer Greg Paris would have come in uh, when Kenton was speaking, he's at the back there. Um, Greg is a former president of the BAP. He's um, one of the principal directors at CEP, which is one of the leading um, engineering firms in Barbados. And Greg has been involved in engineering and engineering works and everything pertaining to engineering for quite a while. He also does some lecturing at the Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology at present as his give back, more or less. So. He's one of the persons that you want to engage with afterwards. He's a civil, civil and structural engineer by profession. So if you have that particular interest, Greg is here that you can engage in that regard. Also at the back, we have engineer Bruce Gopal. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce, you're mechanical electrical? Yes. Electrical engineer. And he works with the, um, bar he works in the Barbados sugar industry. Um, he actually is one of the persons that keeps Portville factory running. So again, if you're of more mechanical, electrical slant, you may want to have a chat with Bruce afterwards. Um, engineer Kenton Gamble, who would have just presented, he is a civil structural um, person. So again, if you have interest in that regard, you can seek out Kenton. Uh, we have um, Alex, you're our engineer, you're a graduate at present. Right, so we have graduate um, engineer Alexander Guppy. He's electrical. So he's gonna present next. So if you are electrically minded, he's a person, one of the persons you can speak to. Um, Akim, you're still a graduate, right? And we have graduate engineer, Akim Nurse. He is also civil and structural in nature. So you can have a chat with him. And um, remind me the name. Matthew McCollin. Matthew McCollin. And you are, right. So Matthew at the front here with the white shirt that looking all snazzy that he got a date afterwards. <laughs> Right, he is a structural civil as well, so you can uh, have a chat with him in that regard. Um, I am construction project management, so anybody that want to discuss that, you can have a chat with me thereafter. And um, like I said, engineers get involved in all types of projects. Um, do not cubbyhole yourself and think that all of what we do is buried in the ground or underneath steel that nobody sees, right? The, one of the, the, the projects I'm currently involved in is the monument that's going up in town. So a colleague and I, we would have won that competition. So we, we also are involved in design and exciting things as well. Um, if you look around here, you'll see this is quite a unique structure. This is not your boring auditorium. You can see some nice expos, um, steel trusses and so on in here, which makes it look a little exciting. So the civil and structural engineer for this building had um, some fun with Mr. Selby's design, right? So um, another thing about engineers, we tend to bury our mistakes as well. And what do I mean by that? If we get it wrong and a building collapses, quite a few people can die. So hence, Ben Kenton said that there needs to be a lot of analysis and there needs to be a lot of uh, conferring with colleagues and there needs to be the building in of safety aspects in, in your design that is why all of that has gone through, because we need to make sure that when a structure is put up, that it's not gonna come tumbling down at the first shake or at the first high wind that you have, okay? Good, so without further ado, um, Alex, you're up next, sir.
Good afternoon to all of you. Um, oh, hey, is that better? Yeah. All right, good afternoon to all of you. Unlike Kenton's 15 slides, I'm going to give you five. <laughs> and this is one of them. <laughs> uh, right, number one, who am I? My name is Alexander Guppy. I am the electrical project manager at Williams Electrical. All right, um, how did I get here? This is how I would have done that, my career path. I did, just like all of you may be doing or have already done, done CXEs, math, physics, electronics is an important one, um, TD, standard English, you know, those things. Uh, tertiary, I went to Barbados Community College, uh, did a double major in mathematics and physics. From there, I went to St. Augustine, UE, and studied electrical and computer engineering. Uh, after completing that, I would have worked at a MEP engineering consultancy for four years. And moving on from there, I would have been where I am right now as an electrical project manager at Williams. That's for one year. Next slide, what did I do? Sorry, what did I do? Um, so the four years I spent at the consultancy, I would have done things like lighting designs, uh, life safety designs, so that's like your fire alarm um, type systems, paths to egress, uh, those type of things, electrical load calculations, making sure that, you know, when you plug in your charger or whatever, it doesn't explode, so to speak. Um, and as well as the main schematics for those types of, or any type of building really. Uh, right, following from there, of course, I would have had to do similar to Kenton, uh, site inspections as well as liaising with clients, architects, and contractors to make sure that everything was per the design and per the client's um, wishes. All right, you could do what do I do now? Right, what do I do now? I basically manage the electrical side of what I used to do in my previous job. All right, so I would take those designs, I will price them, source the materials from suppliers, watch over the installation, ensuring that it does follow the design or if there's something in the design that needs um, you know, flagging with someone, like the consultant or the architect, whoever, I bring those things up to make sure we have the most safe and to code building. All right, uh, and I do this all the way until we actually hand over the project at the end. Uh, for that, I still have to liaise with the, the main contractors on the job, the consultants, the architects, everybody. Uh, and yes, that is pretty much, that's pretty much it. Short and sweet. <laughs> is there? <laughs> Some of you must have questions. I went through that too fast. Just a quick question. So as it relates to electrical, your electrical field, have you ever like, like made a design more efficient or add, add your touch to anything that you implemented? Like say you realize that the photo, whatever photo cell or whatever that they use, you could probably create or design something better. Um, for your scope of work, is that something that you have the, the liberty to do or not? So from that perspective, not necessarily exactly your example where I uh. saw a piece of equipment uh. and I thought I could design it better, but more so a case where, you know, we have all of these old buildings that have been here for 20 plus years. They're not very energy efficient. Mm. So I would go into those buildings and take a look around, evaluate what is there existing and find ways to make that building more energy efficient, okay. right? Um, 
simple example is just changing your fluorescent lights to LEDs. To LEDs, okay. All right, and things like that. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, good evening. I got leave soon, so I want to know when next it gonna have like a interaction slash lecture like this. So I'll answer that question. The next time you have something like this, maybe online. Mm -hmm. We tend to do these once a year, and then normally the secondary schools will reach out to the association when they have their um, careers fair. Um, foundation. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, the next presentation we're going to have is pertaining to financing. So we have some parents here. Uh, we have obviously some students here. And for you students who are not working, I think that money drops out the sky. Uh, it doesn't. Your parents have to work very hard for it. And some of you will discover when you go to um, study overseas that you may actually need to get a part-time job to help supplement your um, income in terms of either, either having to pay for your tuition, um, having to pay for your books, or just uh, being able to buy food when the week come. Uh, because studying overseas can be a bit expensive. So we thought it would be beneficial to have somebody from the credit union who is familiar with the financing options that the credit union offers to give you all a bit of advice in that regard. Um, Glenn will be here afterwards. So if the parents you want to approach Glenn to ask him some questions, um, he will be here. For those of you, um, even though you're not currently members of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union, you're interested in becoming members, Glenn can help you in that regard uh, because we strongly believe that this is where you belong. So I want to encourage everybody to engage um, and, I, and I keep emphasizing engage. I don't want you to go away from here not being knowledgeable, right? Studying can be an expensive undertaking. So the first thing is that as parents and students together, you need to sit and decide, what is it that I want to study? You then need to determine where you can pursue those studies. And in your consideration of where you want to pursue those studies, you want to make sure that um, university is an accredited university. And what do I mean by accredited? That is recognized by a world body or a professional body as an accredited institution of study, so that when you return to Barbados and the Caribbean with your degree, that is, is a recognized degree that permits you to go on to become registered. If it is not a recognized degree, you may have to do some makeup courses in order to qualify to become registered, okay? So the quality of your degree, yes, ma'am? The association has a list of those accredited universities and colleges? We don't have a list, but we can direct you to a link that would have on a list. We normally work with something called the Washington Accord and that Washington Accord would have the universities listed that are considered to be accredited. However, um, if you also look at some of the um, international engineering bodies, um, so the ones in the UK and the States, they would have accredited universities in their jurisdictions um, for, for those different locations. So the ones in Canada, UK, and the United States. So those programs, once they're accredited in those jurisdictions, they will be recognized in the Caribbean, okay? So financing is a very, very big deal, guys. Um, and you, it's something you need to start thinking. Even if you are at the secondary level, you need to start thinking about it from now because it may require your parents taking out a loan and it may have to be a substantial loan. And you have to go into this thing with both eyes open, being aware of all the costs involved. So that would be cost for tuition, that would be cost for travel, if you have to travel overseas, 
that will be cost for your books, even if they're digital. You know, um, that space is changing a little bit, but books, and you also have to have costs for your living allowance. And what do I mean by living allowance? I mean, if you're going to a cold climate, you may need to have money to buy cold clo uh, clothing for the cold climate. You also may need to have money to buy um, your food if you're living outside of the university or if you're living on halls, you may have to have money for the cafeteria and you will have to have money just to move around, bus fare and these type of things. So you have to look at the complete cost of what it is to live overseas, all right? So you need to really ask questions and the professionals in this room, several of them have um, studied overseas. They can give you their experiences and their insights and what considerations you need to have. Okay, parents? So don't be shy uh, to ask the questions, please. So Glenn, over to you, sir. Glenn, you're not doing a, a visual, you're just doing a talk, basically. You have your have presentation? presentation Fantastic. Over to you, sir. I, I guess we're in competition for the number of slaves we have. So I have eight, um, not close to the 15. So I guess he's in the lead for now. Um, as Vincent said, my name is Glenn Belgrave. I'm the branch operations officer um, for the Mile and a Quarter location that the credit union has. Um, I have been in the credit union. Well, I've been in the group. This company now for about 15 years. I started off as a teller, um, worked my way through the different um, sections in the savings department. And then I was moved over to, I got a promotion, I was moved over to our, uh, our sister company, Capital Financial. And I would say that's where my lending career started, my career in financing. Um, I went from loans officer to senior loans officer. Then I came, I transitioned back over to the credit union as the senior financial services rep in the loans department. And then January this year, I was promoted to branch operations officer. So I'm here to speak about what the credit union offers. Um, we offer a wide, wide range of products, um, savings, investment products, and loans. Specifically, we are going to talk about our um, loans today. So as it says here in the slide, we offer a safe space uh, to save and invest. We believe in people. The credit union was built by people for people. And you know, it is one of the only well, sorry, it is indigenous to Barbados. It is Barbadian owned by Barbadians. So the profits don't go back um, to any person outside of Barbados or any company outside of Barbados. So it, it stands within Barbados and it is for your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, it, it helps Barbadians, right? Um, there's so much the credit union offers in terms of our Legacy Foundation, for example, we would have donated, uh, not recently, but we would have donated the dialysis machines to the hospitals. So it, it helps your, your fellow Bajans. Um, that's what the credit union does. Um, we would be sharing information consistently. Um, when I first started financing, I had no idea that I would work with engineers and architects and different stuff like that. And they have to know a little bit of each segment, so I'm glad to be here today. Vincent, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, education. Hmm. The educational loan that we offer starts from as little as, let's say, $500 and goes up to any amount. But Ray want to say the cutoff would be, or the segment would break um, differently, would be that our unsecure amount that we lend, with, this is without any security, this is without any money being you have to put down our land, our car, um, that cuts off at $20,000. So we provide an unsecure loan for our educational purpose up to $10,000. The maximum repayment time for that would be 20 years. And our product is really tailored for parents who want to help out their children um, with a, a loan to get them started, not that the children are coming on their own and not being supported by their parents and have to take on or start the world in this big um, load of debt. So our product is tailored, ta tailored to offer that room so the payment becomes a very small payment um, so that it's, it's more manageable over their course of study. That loan can be a revolving loan, which is like a credit card or a line of credit, 
So if you pay back the principal, it becomes um, available again. No, the next tier, I would say, is the tier where you have to now start looking for security because you're going, you're going over the $20,000 that we can offer on secured. That situation is a little bit more complicated in terms of I would probably more recommend a, mar a, a property versus land or versus um, a car because it gives you a longer period, makes the payment smaller, the interest rate is a lot lower. But financing in itself is a little bit complicated, so I will tell you, come have a seat with a loans officer and because everybody's situation is not the same, everybody's financial situation is totally different. But I'm guaranteeing based on the products that the credit union has, we'll be able to find a solution for you. Yeah? Any questions so far? Yes, please. Hello, sir. Hi. You would say that over around thirty thousand dollars would be considered a problem, like no, no, it wouldn't be considered a problem. Um, as I said, where it starts to get a little bit different, our scenario changes is that you would have passed. No, you'll be ten thousand dollars over our on secure limit. Are you a member of the credit union? No, sir. Your parents? Any of your parents? Yes. Mm. Um, so what I would say is that I can't specifically answer that off because I don't know your parents' situation. But I would give an example here where let's say your mother has $10,000 on her savings or $20,000. Um, she wants to give you, she wants to assist you with that loan. We wouldn't necessarily need security because she would have that savings portion that covers the unsecured, the difference of the unsecured. So we can lend the thirty thousand dollars in that circumstance. The circumstance that we wouldn't be able to lend that thirty thousand dollars would be where there's no savings at all. I see. Uh, right. Uh, another question, sir, about joining the credit union. Can minors join the credit union? Um, yes, you can. All right. Yes, I was you can. To my mother about that. Thank you very yes. much, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. The interest rate varies, and, and that's why I say it's best to um, have a seat. So the interest rate, I would tell you, varies from about 4.75 up to 11%. Yes. You said 20,000 is the... You said 20,000 is the... Um, the Max for your unsecure. What happens if you can't pay the twenty thousand? If you can't pay, yeah, pay it back. If you is can't it, pay it back, yeah, is a loan. <laughs> well, the analysis that goes into the the loan try to we try to analyze how we can mitigate that risk because lending is a risk. If I give you money, I have to look to see that I can get it back. Uh -huh. So that's where you would present your documentation, job letter, pay slips, ID, proof of address. I have to be able to find you. I have to know where you live. I have to know if you can afford to pay, right? Okay. If at some point during your career you can't afford to pay, that then goes into a different segment. That's a whole different, probably Vincent should get those people to come, um, which is, we call that collections. But what I want to say is, is that the credit union will try to help you or guide you to create situations where it becomes even more affordable for you to pay. So in that, we would have to exhaust all possibilities um, before it comes to that situation, we can't pay. Right. Uh, uh, we call those situations more a restructured loan where we, we try to reduce the payment, give you a longer time to pay, whatever the case may be. Okay, thank you. Any other? Mm -hmm. uh, normally, when students go overseas, they need access to cash. Does the credit union offer a credit card of any type or a credit type facility that Right. So the recent change to the carry system where we had to go to MasterCard or Visa card now allows the credit union to give our members debit cards where they can use overseas. So the parents or guardians can put money on their child's account so that they can have that access to the money um, overseas.
You can talk. I can hear you. <laughs> in terms of um, involving loan, mm -hmm. what would be the penalty for paying it back this unsecured in five years? There's, there's absolutely no penalty. Um, one, in the initial stages, many loans are submitted to you. We will try to determine what's best for you, right? Um, but outside of that, the credit union has no early repayment penalties. Uh, the quicker we get back the money is, it means somebody else can borrow the money, right? So we don't, we don't charge for that. That's why we say this is where we belong. <laughs> but I'm going to be here in the back. I, we went past the slides a little bit, so you didn't get to see my eight slides, but we pretty much covered the... Um, gambit of what I was here about um, to say. I'll be here when you're finished. If you have a situation where you want some guidance on some financing, I'll be willing to provide it. If you guys want to take my cell phone number, um, I will share it now, which is 832 0018. You can give me a call and we can probably meet up to try to 832 Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Call again. 832 0018. The, the slide that we, sorry, you went back. The one with the documents. You could go, keep going. Right. Um, these would be the basic documents you would need to present. As I said, everybody's situation is different. So if there's something else we need, we would ask you at the time. But two forms of ID, which I, I mentioned before, proof of address, um, the application form, you would need to obviously complete, complete that form. Estimated expenses for the tuition cost, which is Vincent mentioned travel, he mentioned um, clothing, he mentioned the cost of the study. We would try to put those together because we want to ensure that you don't have a reason to have to cut studying. So we would try to ensure that we have everything covered. Your, your acceptance letter for school, um, your parents' job letter, two recent pay slips. This is what we will pretty much need to formulate or analyze um, a person's situation. Okay? Yes, please. Yes, but obviously we would try to sit and have a conversation with you in terms of, for example, food expense. You have to eat, right? Um, travel, you have an idea of where you're going to stay, how far is it from the school. Um, you would probably, we would recommend that you look into these different costs because it doesn't make any sense just um, only covering the costs for the tuition. You have to be able to get to or from school, if you have to get a laptop, if you have to get um, books, uh, if you have to get different tools to do the, the courses, different calculators, I'm, I'm sure the um, engineers use special scientific calculators um, because I couldn't understand the numbers that was up before, right? Um, but you would need to put together what your expenses possibly could be. And we would try to, so we wouldn't just only say, let's look at the tuition cost. That's a question we we're going to ask at the end of the day, the tuition cost plus the other expenses that you have. Would you be going to school? Would you be housing, for example? Is it on campus housing or is it outside of campus? Like generally, I know students would sometimes seek outside housing because it may be cheaper, but then you have to contemplate the travel to and from school. How much time do you go to school? These different things have to be contemplated, yeah? Um, is there anything else that I can say right now that would help you? I, I would prefer to talk to, people, to you guys on an individual basis, especially if you, everyone would have different situations. Um, so some people, as I say, may present uh, a property as security, um, and as a mortgage, that would have a different um, overlook in terms of how we analyze it. We would probably need like a valuation to determine how much the property is worth. Um, serviceability is one of the other factors that we have to consider at the end of the day um, because it's a debt. In the industry, I would let you know that we call the uh, educational loan a, a good debt, right? Because it, it brings a benefit, it brings education, it helps people grow their, their financial um, platform. So pretty much that's it from me today. If you need any other questions answered though, I'll be here, okay? Thank you for having me. 
All right, so we have a giveaway. Uh, let's see who was paying attention. So for this first giveaway, can you give me three forms of basic documentation required to start a loans process? Who wants to, uh, 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 who, all right, come see our world. I see your hand come up. Talk loud, I know he's a sergeant. You could call orders loud, so I want to hear you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, that would be an estimate of the expenses, the acceptance letter, and a fully completed application form. That's correct. Good. That's correct. All right. Well done, Ms. World. Uh, let's go to Stacey at the back, and she has your prize for you. Thanks, Glenn. We have another giveaway um, after the next presentation. So uh, at this stage, guys, when we're talking about money and finances, you want to check out all of the financial options that are available for you as a student that is looking to acquire a, a loan for your um, educational study. So you have to check out places like the Student Revolving Loan. I think the, the threshold there has been extended to see what it is they're offering, but the Student Revolving Loan may not give you the full quantum of what you require depending on where you're going to study. So you may still need to take an additional loan, and that's where um, the types of loans that the credit union offer uh, may be beneficial to you. There are also obviously other banking institutions that will offer you educational type loans. You need to check those out and you need to do your comparisons as to interest rate, what's the securities and those type of things to see which is going to work better for you. So um, there is a bit of homework to be done. Um, even though you have identified that you want to go, let's say, to Japan to study, you need to understand what it costs to get to Japan. You need to check out and see are there scholarship options at the university I'm looking at that I can possibly apply for? Or you have to really dig down and investigate it thoroughly to see what is required, okay? And beforehand, parents, you can obviously come in to the credit union or go into your financial institution to see how much you would qualify for in terms of a loan because that is also important. You need to know what you qualify for so you can set your um, realistic um, the realistic goals as to what you can afford or where you may be afford to um, let your child go to study. So please keep that in mind. All right, so we have one more presentation this afternoon and that's coming from engineer Akeem Nurse. And Akeem is also gonna be presenting a little bit on what is required to become an engineer. So Akeem, come, come. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. The number of my slides is going to be a surprise. All right? <laughs> that was a mystery. Um, now, we're going to share a little bit into my life, my experience, uh, my journey thus far. And this little youngster here at age four years old is me. Right? Time Magazine. Next slide. You may know this fella, a good friend of mine. Really? All right? <laughs> Einstein, everybody knows Einstein here, right? Now we're gonna be answering some questions and going through some myths that people might have pertaining to entering or wanting to do engineering, all right? It could be a little intimidating, so hopefully we'll be able to get some answers to those questions at the end of this presentation. What is engineering? And do you have to be a genius to study engineering? So again, thank you for coming out to BAPE's Student Interaction Session. So a little bit about myself. My name is Akim Nurse. I'm a graduate civil and structural engineer. I currently work at a consultancy, Alan Armstrong Associates Limited. I'm a graduate member of BAPE, and I also hold the post of the graduate observer for BAPE, which is my responsibility is to basically keep keep in touch with the graduates after university and help them along the, the, the journey of becoming an engineer and letting them know more about the association. So my journey, past to present. Session, secondary school, now I knew nothing about engineering. I didn't know what was, I didn't know what a civil engineer was. I wanted to be an architect originally. So did maths, the building um, technology construction, technical drawing, vigil arts, English, 
and some other CSCs. Now, unlike my colleague Kenton, who went and did CAPE, I went and did the associate degree at Community College, Barbados Community College. And the difference from my experience going into university now and having colleagues that did CAPE was that they had a very good, they had strength in the math courses. They were very, very good at the math courses compared to the students that came out to community college. It was a little harder to, to, to do the math courses. However, the advantage that the students that went community college had was that the practical, the practical knowledge, they had more experience in the practical aspect of engineering. And just hinting to what, or referring to what Kenton had mentioned, and more of the physics, more the statics, mechanics, the solids, those are courses. So if you go to Cape Route, most likely you're going to have a strong foundation in the theoretical math, math subjects, which would be an asset to you when you go to university. But you might be missing out on some practical uh, experience. Whereas if you go to BCC, you would not have that strength in math, but you will have a lot of practical experience dealing with engineering, which would help you also at university. So coming out of university, graduated with my bachelor's degree in civil engineering. And now I work as a graduate engineer at Allen Armstrong Associates currently. So, so what is civil engineering? Again, when I first when I first want, um, decided to pursue my passions, it was in architecture. Didn't know what civil engineer is. So most people, or a lot of people, might not know as well. So what is civil engineering? Now, engineering is the closest thing to magic that exists in the world. Elon Musk. So everybody knows Elon Musk, I assume, right? CEO of Tesla. Electrical car, electrical car manufacturer, and SpaceX. A fun fact, he studied physics and not engineering. Now going more into civil engineering now, the definition given by ICE, Institution of Civil Engineers, it's about roads and roadways, schools, offices, hospitals, water and power supply, and much more the kinds of things we take for granted but would find life very hard to live without. So when you look at this building, engineering, civil engineering, structural engineering. When you look at road, civil engineering. When you look at uh, a drainage system, a water tank, engineering. So a day in life in my office. Again, I'm a graduate engineer. So I am being mentored and trained so, so that I'll be able to apply for my license as an engineer. So a project comes in the office. Individual wants to build a house, for instance. The first thing that we would do, we would do reconnaissance. We would look at the lot, look at the location, see what is the terrain, see the ground levels. If there's existing structures, we would do a site a site drawing, taking up the dimensions, where it's located. And that information would help guide us make decisions with the client to get this house built. Now we do design analysis, which Kenton would have mentioned. We look at the loads that this structure, this house, is going to experience. The live load, the dead load, the dead load being the actual weight of the structure itself. The live loads, the experiences going to have pertaining to the people in it, furniture, and earthquake and wind. So we do all the checks to make sure that we could size the beams, the columns, the walls, the roof, so that in the event that a hurricane happens, an earthquake happens, or the just general life of the structure that is able to be structurally stable. After we do all those 
design checks and analysis. We need to be going to project management now. So generally speaking, in my office, we prepare bills of quantity. We attend meetings, conduct site inspections, and provide progress reports. Now, bills of quantity is a document provided that lists all the materials, the quantities of the materials, and the costs of those quantities for the whole project. And that is very vital because as the project goes on, and the contractor, the builder, decides to send in a valuation or decide to, to send in an invoice. We could use that document to see how much has been done and verify that, well, yes, he did 10%, 20%. He built the, he excavated the ground for this house. He put in the foundations build the walls. So we check back, make sure that the quantities match back, and we could verify that the contractor has done his work, pay the contractor. We attend meetings. In a project, you will always have meetings. Yeah, do project inspections, which we hinted earlier, and provide progress reports to the client. Now, in my experience, I would have been working, designing houses, from houses to substations, from substations to solar farms, from solar farms to water tanks, swimming pools. But the more notable projects we're going to just take a look at, just two in particular. So. This first project is a 10 megawatt solar farm located in Trent St. Lucie, owned by Barbados Lightning Power, right? Now, our responsibility as civil and structural engineers, especially for this project, was to ensure that the drainage was satisfied. So on this site, they have a series of suck wells and detention ponds to ensure to ensure that when a heavy rainfall occurs and flooding starts to be initiated, that those wells could take away all of that water and keep the site dry and protect the solar panels. In this project, as you would know, not only civil engineering went into this, but electrical and mechanical also went into this project as well. So m m most, if not all the time, you will be working in a team, collaborating with other professionals as well. Second project is the Clean Bridge Energy project, also by Light and Power, and this is on the same site, Trent St. Lucie. Now, this project, we did the drainage as well, but we also dealt with the structural elements pertaining to the administration, building the warehouse and the workshop areas. So yeah, so again, so that is my presentation. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to answer. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening again. If we wanted to contact you, um, where can we um, contact you? Oh, yeah. Well, after the session, you could always come to me um, personally, okay. and I could give you my contact information and my office contact information. Okay. Yeah. So another Never question. Wrong. Yes, please. Um, with the solar project that you had, I am thinking, I think it was the second last slide. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question about the... The reason why you use, I think that's white marl on the project, right? Marl. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why? Oh, so that picture was taken before the full completion of the project. Mm -hmm. So the marl, we normally put it as a sub base for the roads. Okay. All right. So you would have, yeah. So the marl layout is basically the incomplete 
stage of the, war, of, of the driveways or the roads on the site. So we you normally layer marl, and then you put up your asphalt or, or your other course, depending on the type of road. Okay, and this is done for all projects that you do? Yeah, typically. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Questions? Any more questions? No questions about Einstein? <laughs> Go ahead, sir. What is the best time between becoming a graduate engineer and a qualified engineer? Okay. Okay, good question. Now, as Vincent had mentioned earlier, just coming out of school isn't going to give you that professional distinction as an engineer. So you must have a degree in engineering. And the minimum years is four years of, the, of engineering experience, all right? And then you can apply for your license. Currently, there's no exams, but as recent, I believe last week, we had a seminar talking about the updated application to become an engineer. Um, and this application breaks down seven competencies that you must, you must have to become an engineer. So you have your degree, you have your four years, and then you apply you, 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 you complete your application to meet those seven competencies. Yeah, which is separate from BIT, right? So a lot of people, so the Barbados, the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers and the ERB, the ERB, the Engineer Registration Board, they would be the ones who would review your application and give you an interview. And once you meet that criteria, having a degree, having four years engineering experience and filling out that application, you will have an interview and then you'll be able to get your license once your application is. We want to add though, just to make sure that you all are clear, and sort of ties into when Kenton was presenting, in terms of checking child patients if we know that we make a mistake or not. Working for four years alone is not the sole criteria. It's working for four years under a registered engineer. engineer. Right? So you can't. Before we had um, experiences where someone could come back from studying, we have a manufacturing company that wants to bring on a young, a young engineer, like that's data engineering. They would have worked four years with no supervision, just learning the ropes along the way from non-technical staff and others in the company. When four years come and then they want to fight to become an engineer, it can't happen because there's no one that was signing off on their work along the four years. So the critical caveat is, it's four years under supervised um, engineering direction, right? So from a senior registered engineer, right? So let's understand that. So don't just think that when you come up work four years in some field, but then you apply and it's automatic. It's not that way, all right? Any other questions in that regard, Yes, sir. I have a question about the roads. Mm -hmm. In terms of when you're doing the construction of a building, what's the difference? What's the difference in building the road first and doing it after? So, in construction of building, what's the difference in doing the road first mm -hmm. and doing the road after? Yeah. Right. So, for a, a normal home, but on larger projects, you tend to have something called hall roads as well. Basically, these are temporary roads to carry um, large vehicle moral material on site for construction. The, then you put in your, your, your permanent roads um, after. Main, the main reason is that when you, do, you don't want to be dirtying up your road, you don't want to be um, destroying the, the asphalt with different materials and stuff like that. So normally, you would finish your construction of the building, and then asphalt intends to be the finishing stage of the project. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Follow question in terms of the qualification. 
Mm -hmm. After you become an engineer, locally, the qualified engineer have to do professional exams or not necessarily exams, but continue maintaining the accreditation. Yeah, so currently the does the uh, Barbados doesn't require exams annually. But as re recently the ERB uh, is requiring to you to ensure that you keep up with your continuous development. So you have seminars that be hosts that would have CDP points. And once you tally those, once you go to those seminars and tally up those points, they would be under review. But currently we don't have any exam that would engineers who would have studied abroad um, based on the selection of topics that they would have had to get their engineering degree, degree. They may not have qualified for being a member of BAKE. If they are currently working and doing engineering tasks, um, you talked about having interview and having interview processes. Would this um, if they're doing the work and they can show projects that they're doing the work, um, will that assist them in becoming a registered engineer? Okay, so just to clarify a couple of things, because you said a lot there, and I want to um, unpack little pieces at a time for everybody's benefit. If the person has gone off to study um, engineering discipline, whatever that engineering discipline is, 
Um, I don't see a reason why they should not be able to join the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers. Um, there's a standard application form, and they are invited to fill out that application form and submit it. There are different um, levels of membership within the association, so whereas they may not come in the association as an engineer, there is an associate membership, there is graduate membership, there is student membership, and then the, the ultimate is our fellowship. So they possibly could fit into the association in some aspect, especially if they are doing um, engineering works in some form or fashion. Now, if they want to register, to become a registered engineer of practice in Barbados, that's completely different. The registration board, the engineer's registration board is a uh, um, statutory um, instrument of the government where they are the persons who make sure that engineers go through an uh, aspect of rigor that would then uh, to make sure that they are competent to be registered as engineers. So with the work experience, again, there's an um, application process. And if you go on to the ERB's website, or if you go on to the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers website, and you go to the link there that shows the registration process, those competencies that was referred to by Akeem, if they satisfy the competencies, if the degree is a recognized degree, and I said earlier, because I know you came a little late, you must make sure that the student or the person who is pursuing the study have done a recognized engineering degree. Sometimes persons may go off and do a degree which is not from a accredited university or is not an accredited program. And in that instance, they may have to do some makeup courses. And with the internet, this is possible. You can do makeup courses to bring your accreditation up to standard. But you may need to do um, check out the website. And if you need to call the office, Stacy's behind there, the person can contact Stacy, and Stacy can either set up a meeting with somebody from the ERB where they can seek some guidance from one of our professionals as to next steps and what they will need to do to bring themselves up to a, um, uh, a level that they could be considered to be registered. So they can uh, avail themselves of the advice, either through the association or through the ERB or both. Okay? But we're here to work with your, your, you, ma'am, or your, um, the person that you're speaking about. So please let them reach out and let's see how we can work with you in that regard, okay? There are some, uh, and let's put this here now, there are some opportunities. You may be offered a scholarship, let's say, to Cuba. Uh, we've had several Barbadians have gone off to do varying professions in Cuba, whether it is a medical, engineering, architectural. However, because Cuba operates under a system that is not recognized by our laws here, you must be aware of this. So when you come back to have that transition into being a professional in any of those um, bodies of study, you'll have to find out how do you make that bridge or how do you come across from your, what you studied to being qualified as a professional in the jurisdiction that you're going to work in, okay? So you need to, like I said, you need to go into this thing with both eyes open. Mm -hmm. If you get a scholarship to some place, fantastic and great. By all means, consider it. But you also have to look at what that means. When you get that degree, is it going to be recognized where I am planning to work after I graduate? If not, what do I have to do then to get recognition of the degree? Okay, and there are... Uh, places that may offer scholarships that are not recognized under the Washington Accord, which we subscribe to. 
So again, you need to check it out and you need to go into this thing with your eyes wide open. All right. So just to give some closing notes because I don't want to bore you anymore. And then by all means, as I said, please interact. Just don't bolt for the door and try and get home. This is your opportunity to come and ask some questions. You might have been a little shy earlier to go to the mic, but please speak to one of our professionals. Speak to Glenn at the back about financing. Ask the question. So when you leave here this evening, you are in a better position than when you came. Uh, young man, you said you're a graduate engineer. Perhaps you want to find out about registration. You can speak to Engineer Paris. You can speak to Kenton, who's just completed that. You can speak to Akeem, who is going through the process now. There are persons here you can speak to as well. Okay? So, just a recap, guys. So, we start at the O level, or what I used to call O level in my days. Um, I think it's called CSEC now, um, where you need to do six to eight subjects to qualify for the next level of study. Then you get to A level, or CAPE, as it's called now, where you have, I think the focus is usually three subjects. And the subjects we would want you to consider if you are looking to do an engineering degree for what is called matriculation, the subjects that you need to have, more often than not, would be mathematics is a must. Um, either chemistry or physics, depending on the type of engineering you're looking to pursue. Other subjects that are useful would be technical drawing, design and technology, geography, right? Those subjects uh, will get you in, or uh, what we will call the prerequisites that will get you into most engineering programs. If you're going into a specific discipline of engineering that may be a little outside of the norm, you will have to see what the entry requirements for that course will be and to make sure where you're going to study offers those subjects. So that's if you take the CAPE at, uh, approach, which is the approach that engineer Kenton would have taken. If you go to the Barbados Community College approach, after you have your six to eight uh, CSEC subjects, you apply to the Barbados Community College to get in one of their um, associate degree engineering programs. And if you do the engineering associate degree in building and civil, some of the subjects you will cover are building technology, workshop practice, engineering mathematics, structures, land surveying, quantity surveying, you have elective subjects, and I think you also have a design project. Um, my friend who is doing the mechanic, sorry, the electrical, what are the subjects you guys are doing for at BCC for the electrical aspect? Yes, sir. We're mechanical. All right, well, give me your subjects that you're, some of the subjects you're doing. Um, we have, sorry. We was looking at, right now we're doing material science. Um, we did electrical uh, magnetism. So um, the subject matter will vary depending on the, the um, profession or the, the associate degree that you're pursuing, okay? That associate degree would then permit you to matriculate into university and you'll have again here to do some research. Um, it used to be, I'm not sure if it still is, uh, perhaps one of the current students here could answer that question for any of you in secondary school. Um, the associate degree program used to take a year off of uh, your standard American university entry. It may not do the same for your entry into a British or Canadian university. However, you may get some credits, but again, you have to investigate and find out. The American degree, I think, is usually like a four-year degree, so it will take a year off of that, and you may be able to go straight into your second year. Um, the subject matter that you do may be sufficient or adequate to get you into the first year of your civil engineering degree if you go to the UK or to Canada. But you have to, these are things you have to investigate. Depending on the country that you're considering, whether it's Trinidad, United States, um, Canada, the UK, those are the popular options. You need to understand what the matriculation requirements are. What do I mean by matriculation requirements? What are the subjects that will be recognized to get me into the program I'm aspiring to study? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? If you don't say it, don't you look stupid, you know, tell me if you don't understand. You understand what I'm saying? All right, good. The next option to you is the Samuel Jackman um, Prescott Institute of Technology. 
Engineer Paris does a bit of teaching there, mathematics. And from memory, you can do architectural drafting. There's a carpentry and journey program, mechanics, plumbing, electrical, photovoltaic installation. Now, just to do some classification, these subjects are what you would consider to be technician level subjects. If you go to the BCC, you'll be doing what is more or less called technologist level subjects. So if you're doing technician level subjects, you may have to do some other makeup courses to be able to get into a university program, okay? The technician level subjects would permit you to go into the working environment as a technician. So if you go and work with Mr. Gopal at the factory, you will be able to get in there and be really dealing with uh, some of those large turbines and the, and the different um, generators and so on, they're having there at a technician level. If you go to work with Mr. Gopal from the community college, you're going to be doing a bit of that hands-on stuff, but you may also be required to do some work inside of the office because your training affords you a greater level of uh, accountability and responsibility. When you do the degree program now and you are on your way to becoming an engineer, you take on not only, you not only understand the nuts and bolts of how those engines and generators and everything else inside of the factory setting work, but you're also required to do a management aspect to that as well and manage those mechanics and those technicians and the persons who keep those engines going, all right? So if you're going to go to the Simon Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology, be aware that you will have to do some additional study in order to get into a engineering first degree program. Is that understood? Yeah? Okay. So in terms of work experience, um, I want to make a recommendation here. And I know there's this um, mindset that some of our young people have, and I think I probably had it when I was young as well, that if you go to do a summer job that you have to be paid, um, especially if you're not qualified, I really want to get you out of that mindset. Um, nobody's going to hire you right now because you don't have any work experience. That's the reality of the Barbados you live in. You don't have an ounce of work experience. Nobody's interested in hiring you. However, if you attire yourself properly, and by attiring yourself properly, I don't mean looking that you're going to be fit. Actually put on some business attire and approach a design office or engineering firm and said, I would like to have the opportunity to get some working experience. I don't want to be paid. I would just like to come in for a week or two. Most persons might actually be reasonable and want to hear what you have to say. But you have to go with a professional approach and ask a question professionally. Um, the usual approach I know is to write a CV and to flood these offices probably in May or June and more likely than not, you're not gonna get a response. If, if there are about 12, 13 students here, so I can share this intimately with you, give you the heads up on everybody else. If you want to get a look and a peep into what it is that you may be considering doing as a subject, then you need to, to up your game and change your approach. And make, call the offices, ask to speak to the executive assistant and set up an appointment and come in and present yourself and offer to come in you would like the opportunity to come in for a couple of weeks to see what that office does to shadow and to get an appreciation so that you can be sure that what it is you think you want to do is actually what you want to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now that is a little different to what you would normally hear people tell you to do. But I somehow think that if you take that approach, it will be very beneficial to you down the road, right? I have a person here who I mentor. I'm not going to make her embarrassed, but I think she's sitting down right here, so. Um, I actually sent her to Engineers Paris office, I think, for a day, so that she can get an appreciation of what she was considering studying to make sure it was what she wanted to do next, all right? And I know some of you may have this, I don't know, Disneyland expectation of what persons do in professions. You need to engage. When you see opportunities like this come up, Come and ask people questions. Don't stand home and think you know what the profession involves. Come and find out what it really involves. It can sometimes involve being on a job site. Um, professionals, and I say professionals, I'm not going to specify any particular um, profession, 
but professionals sometimes, depending on what they're doing, usually have to work some long hours. But because they have to work some long hours, the pay also can be quite good. But you need to understand what it entails. It's not just all fun and games. It is something called work, real, real work, right? And you got, if you come in to do engineering, the one thing that you're going to re be required to do, which is probably a little different, is to actually use your brain and think, right? You just can't slide in and pretend you ain't thinking on any given day. People expect you to think because you can either be doing analysis and calculations and persons can be coming to you and asking you questions and you're expected to have answers. So it does require a lot of thinking. So if you're not into the thinking thing, no problem. Maybe engineering is not what, maybe you could go and do like accounts or something, so, right? But if you want to do something that's exciting, that every day is different, that you can actually do something and you see a benefit, you, you build something, whether it's above ground or below ground that benefits society, then consider a, a, a profession in the engineering field, okay? So I talk enough. I think everybody's spoken enough. This is your opportunity now for the next 30 minutes to engage. Glenn is at the back. Greg is at the back. These young men that come out looking like GQ here at the front, they're here. Mr. Gopal is at the back in the black shirt. So I am here, so please do engage with us. And um, students and parents, before you leave, there's a, a bag at the back by Stacy um, to take with you. So thank you so much for coming this afternoon.